Uh, so good morning, my name is Lauren, and um, thank you for coming to the first talk. And uh, I'm going to be presenting the paper Consolidating Security Notions in Hardware Masking. So we have a problem because adversaries can uh, extract secrets from our devices by looking at power consumption or electromagnetic radiation. One of the solutions that the community has come up with is to start masking our implementations. Um, uh, but the question is, how do we know that masking give, provides security against side channel analysis? For this, we have started, um, we rely on proofs uh, where we abs make an abstract model of the adversary's powers. And a very popular mo uh, adversary model in this context is the probing model by Ishai, Sahai, and Wagner. It basically assumes that the adversary can put D probes, uh, can probe any uh, D intermediates of the circuit. Um, and these probes, uh, they give exact information, instantaneous and stable, uh, and it's also independent from any other intermediates in your calculation. The reason that this model is so popular is because security, it has been proven that security in this model also implies security in other more realistic models, um, like the noisy leakage and the bounded moment security model. And basically we assume that if our mass implementation is secure in the deep probing model, then we provide security against an adversary performing deep order DPA. So what do we do when we're masking? Uh, well, clearly we need to make sure that um, any combination of D intermediates does not reveal anything about the secret. So how do we do that? We split our secrets into at least D plus one shares, and we have to find a way to implement our, um, our cryptographic functions in a way that at no point are there D intermediates that reveal anything about the secret. This is a little bit more tricky in hardware because we have this effect called glitches, um, which is a temporary change in a signal before it stabilizes at the intended value. So during this glitch, instead of computing the function that we want to compute, the, the wire is computing, uh, let's say, a glitch function, and it's very difficult to predict what this glitch function is going to be because it does not only depend on your circuit, but it also depends on your place and routing, your platform, even the temperature of the execution environment. So it's pretty impossible to model glitches. So we're gonna use an adversary model that's quite high level. So you can see here our system, it consists of combinational logic clouds, okay, this really does not work. Um, combinational logic clouds and sequential logic blocks. The sequential blocks are memory blocks that stop glitches from propagating. So we can assume that all these wires are stable coming out of those blocks. So now we have the deep probing model, but we assume that when the adversary probes a wire, let's say he probes this wire, then he could get more information because of glitches happening in this combinational logic. And to make sure that we account for the worst possible glitch that could happen, we're gonna assume that the adversary sees all of these wires going into the cloud. Um, similarly, if he probes this wire, then he also sees these wires. We call them the glitch extended probe. So the glitch extended probe consists of all the stable wires that are required to calculate the normal probe. And by assuming that the adversary has this information, we can assume also the worst possible glitch can happen. And this is a very easy way of looking at things because uh, it's very high level, um, it's independent of the platform. You don't even have to know what is going on inside these combinational clouds. You only have to know which wires are going where. So what is this talk about? It's about one very small, simple formula. Um, which says that the mutual information of something and something has to be zero. So my promise for this presentation is that with this very simple formula, you can prove security in a lot of different models, whether it be with or without glitches, or composable or not, with um, any type of masking. You can even use it if you have non-uniform sharings. You can also use various leakage functions. So in the paper, we have a lot of proofs for what I'm gonna say, but I don't wanna put proofs in a presentation, so I'm gonna refer you to the paper for that if you want. Instead, I'm gonna tell you a story. So the story of this paper starts with the paper that I presented last year at Chess in Amsterdam. So there I presented a multiplicative masking of AES in hardware, and um, like with any masking, you wanna, make you wanna be able to prove that it is secure. And this was very difficult for us because there are a lot of verification tools in the literature, but, um, and we tried a lot of them, but we couldn't use any of them for two reasons. 
The first being that we're using multiplicative masking and a lot of the tools assume Boolean masking. And the second reason is that we have this block that uses a lot of, reuses a lot of randomness, which also is not very compatible with uh, the tools at that point. Um, so this means that as a result, we had to uh, create a very long appendix of manual proofs. Um, and I can tell you making those was not the highlight of my PhD and I don't think reading them is very enjoyable either. Um, but the biggest problem with manual proofs is that they, they leave a lot of room for human error. I'm not saying I made an error, but um, we wanted to have some more uh, security. So we wanted to use a tool. And one of my co-authors had a tool which was presented at FSC in 2016. Um, and this is a tool for flaw detection. And it works like this. So you have a software implementation of your, of your implementation. Yeah. Um, and you're going to make simulated traces that consist, um, that have one time sample for every single intermediate in your calculation. And you can collect simulated traces. And then as you would do with real power traces, you can perform TVLA uh, for leakage detection. But in this case, you can, it would be a flaw detection because it's, it's absolutely noiseless. And flaws cannot be hidden by noise like in the real world. So it's a very effective flaw detection tool. Also, if you want to verify higher order security, then just like with real power traces, you can combine different time samples in the trace with like a centered product and perform TVLA on that. So the only problem with this tool was that it was made for software and we had to verify security in the presence of glitches. So we figured, okay, let's replace all the normal probes with the glitch extended probes and then make simulated traces in this way and um, do the same thing, TVLA. So yeah, that works. Um, but the problem is you cannot use this for higher orders because we realized that you cannot combine two glitch extended probes in a product because then you lose information. So, and we couldn't find any compression operation that compresses two glitch extended probes into one. So uh, we decided that the only way to comprehensively test glitch security was to concatenate the glitch extended probes. Say that you want to verify second order security, then um, you're gonna create a different kind of simulated trace where for every combination or for every pair of intermediates in your calculation, you create a time sample that consists simply of the glitch extended probes concatenated. You make simulated traces in that way and then for every time sample, we would look at the probability distributions and uh, we would make sure with a key square test that for different secrets, that probab probability distribution is the same. So essentially what we were testing is that the mutual information of the glitch extended probes and the secret is zero. So here you have that little equation that I was talking about. So at this point, we realized that um, normal probing security without glitches was already defined this way back in 2010. So there was, um, there was a definition that said, given any D wires, you wanna make sure that the mutual information of those D wires and the secret is equal to zero. And now the only thing that we did to extend this with glitches was replace the normal wires each with their glitch, glitch extended probes and make sure that the mutual information of those glitch extended probes with the secret is equal to zero. So we have here the same equation, the same formula used for probing security with or without glitches. Um, and so now we're gonna look at different security notions in the field and um, key, integrate them also into this same framework. So since we're talking about hardware masked implementations, um, we have to talk about threshold implementations because they were the first provably secure masking scheme in the presence of glitches. How they achieved this is with two properties. Um, so the first one being non-completeness, which says that for any block computing an output share, you wanna make sure that it's independent of at least one input share. So that means that whatever glitch happens in this block, it cannot reveal anything about that input share that it's independent of. And then this means if you also have uniformity, that not knowing this input share means you don't know anything about the secret. So that's how they proved the security in the presence of glitches and how, how we can now again prove it with um, the new formulation. But this relationship only holds for first order. So at crypto 2015, it was shown that um, non-completeness and uniformity are not sufficient for higher order security. 
which is interesting because still in the last four years, you can find a lot of masking um, papers um, that actually talk mostly about non-completeness and uniformity. And I'm gonna leave the rest up to the third talk of this session to talk about that. So, um, what can we say about these properties now? First of all, non-completeness is a very useful property. So even though it's not sufficient and you cannot really use it to prove security of your scheme, it is necessary. So we can show also with this new formulation that glitch extended probing security implies non-completeness, which we kind of already knew. But so it's a necessary condition for your security and it'll, it's also easy to verify. There's a very efficient verification tool by um, Victor Aribas that checks non-completeness. Um, then uniformity is not only not sufficient, but it's also not necessary. So we show in this work, we demonstrate that you can make a probing secure um, sharing without uh, having uniform sharings. So um, uniformity is very useful if you are trying to create a first order masking, um, then it's a nice rule of thumb that you should have, that when, when you have uniformity and non-completeness, you know you're gonna have probing security. But if you're trying to prove the security of a higher order masking scheme, then uniformity is neither sufficient nor necessary. And it's also actually even more difficult to verify than this newer formulation. So yeah. Um, another thing to keep in mind about these two properties is that they kind of have a univariate nature. And up to this day, the definitions ha have not really been extended for multivariate security. And also, if you wanna check them, you need a lot of knowledge about your circuit. So you need to know uh, which wire belongs to which share um, and which share belongs to which variable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is all information that you don't really need to verify this. So um, that's for probing security. But probing security is not composable. And for this reason, there's another line of works about non-interference and strong non-interference, which are uh, notions of composability. So another thing about these notions is that they, they can make the verification of probing security more efficient. And this is done in the mask verif tool of Gilles Bartel, Sonia Bilait, and other people, which is a very efficient um, and nice tool. So what are these notions? They basically say that if your adversary is probing um, intermediates of your circuit and outputs of your circuit, you wanna make sure that these probes can be simulated using a set of input shares that is bounded in size by the number of probes you're using. And whether or not you count the output probes or not is what makes the difference between non-interference and strong non-interference. So these notions are stronger than T-probing security. Originally, they were introduced only for glitches. Uh, no, sorry, without glitches originally. And then last year at Chess, um, there was the work on the robust pro probing model, which extended these definitions with physical defects, such as, for example, glitches. Now at this point, the definitions came without a mathematical formulation. So what we wanted to do in this work is unite them with this new mutual information uh, framework. So in the paper, we show that um, the checking these things means checking this formulation, which again checks the mutual information of your set of probes with not a secret this time, but a number of shares. So uh, this maybe looks a little bit complicated. So let me give you an example. Suppose that you're only probing outputs and you want to verify S and I, that means that this set S is empty and the equation becomes that the mutual information of your probes and the entire input sharing is equal to zero. So you can see here the subtle difference with probing security because in that case you would have independence with the secret and in this case you have independence with the input sharing and that's exactly what gives you this composability. And finally, now that we have this, it's very easy to also have these definitions with glitches because all we have to do is replace the normal probes with glitch extended probes. And um, why stop there? So in the last years, a lot of people have noticed that there is a gap between theory and practice. For example, last year at Chess, Thomas de Knudde presented a work about coupling, which basically showed that the independence leakage assumption um, does not always hold. Another, also in software masking, a lot of people notice that the CPU can introduce extra leakages into software implementations that are actually considered theoretically secure. So what does this mean? It means that our theory is incomplete. Um, again, I'm gonna refer to the robust probing model paper from last year, which um, started to extend our theory by 
defining new kind of probes, not only glitch extended probes, but also extended probes for memory transitions or coupling. And the point is that we can keep using the same framework um, of the mutual information with these new extended probes, and that way we can test security in a whole bunch of new models. In the future, if we can find new definitions for probes that accurately reflect what, what is happening, how the leakage is happening, then we can um, keep using the same framework and test security in those models. And the best part is, if we have tools that check this um, formula, for example, the mass curve tool implicitly also verifies this, um, we can keep using the same tools because we only have to replace our current probes with these extended probes. So that brings me back to the, uh, what I was saying, the slide from the beginning, so all the advantages of this one simple equation, um, which can be used to check uh, the, the security of, um, it can be used to check probing security or composable security, um, with or without glitches or in other models. You can also apply an other leakage function to the probes than the identity function. You could apply a Hamming weight leakage function, for example. So you can do a lot of things with that. And then I'm gonna end uh, with a conclusion, which is basically the, the definition of consolidating, because consolidating is a popular word in the title of crypto papers in this context. That's not the only reason why we chose this. Um, so we, there are two definitions, the, one, the first one being quite obvious, it means to join together or to unite. So we wanted to unite all these different security concepts in the, in the literature into one framework, with or without glitches, um, et cetera. And then the second meaning says it's to make more strong or solidify. And so with this work, we want to strengthen our understanding of how to bring physical defects into our theoretical models. Thank you. Any questions? Yep, please come to the mic. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, could you go back to the page where you explained the simulated traces with um, glitch extended props? Sorry, the simulation with glitch extended. You mean the at the at in the beginning? At the beginning, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, could you explain how you get this uh, value, like nine eight three one f five? So, so that's a combination from it's just a it's just a toy example, right? But we got here um, yeah. we've got here in the normal software model we have a variable b one which is nine a yeah. and sorry which pro mm, three one and f five. So we got um, f five and three one here. So in the glitch extended probe version, b one and m one are combined because they are used to compute compute one variable, so we get 3, 1, and 9a as a glitch extended probe. And then we still have this f5 here, which is a single normal probe. Um, and then if you're verifying second order security, yeah. you just concatenate these things and you get this. Um, can I ask what kind of leakage model you're using? So the thing, um, if you mean identity model or Hemingway model, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, I mean, um, if you do it this way, if you think about this, this 9A31F5 is actually a linear model because it's just cascading all everything together. It's not actually linear because by verifying the probability distribution of this thing, you're, you're checking the joint probability distribution, which includes any function that you can compute on these things as input. If you would take a nonlinear function that uh, computes on 9a, 3, 1, and f5, um, and that would leak, then also the distribution of this entire big variable would leak. Am I? Oh, okay, yeah, right, right, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Any other question? I have one question. How do you efficiently compute mutual information? Sorry? How do you efficiently compute mutual information? So we've actually never computed it. Uh, we, we computed by looking at distributions. So um, in, in a tool like this, um, you can compute either exact probability distributions or experimental, depending on whether you're drawing inputs randomly or going over them exhaustively. And if they are, if we could use random inputs, then we use a chi square test to check that the mutual information is approximately oh. zero. Um, and otherwise, it's just exact equality of the probability distributions.
Uh, I, I think we do, um, don't have time for another question, so hope we can take it offline. If okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, when when you consider mutual information among more than two variables, you can get strange things happening. Um, for example, the conditional entry. If if I take an XOR of a secret key and a plain text, both chosen at random, and I consider the conditional entropy of the secret key given the plain text, that's full entropy still, and if I consider separately the conditional entropy of the key given the ciphertext, that's also zero. But if I, if I know the plaintext and the ciphertext, I reveal the secret key completely. So when you, I, I'm not quite sure on your definition of mutual information of a set of probes and the secret key, are you considering that you know all, all the values of the probes simultaneously, or are you looking at them just one by one? I, sorry, I didn't catch every part of your question, but so yeah, uh, let's Sorry, uh, we offline. are running behind schedule. Can we take it offline, the question? Okay. We'll, we'll talk in a break. <laughs>